first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen and complete the notes about two people who work at ESCO Engineering. Oh, hi Maggie, it's Greg. Hi Greg. I'm phoning to check some information about some of the staff. I'm putting all the staff data into new files and I notice that I don't have files for two people. I think you might have them. Oh really? What are their names? Peter Austin and Jane Moore. Let me have a look. Yes. I've got them here. Shall I send them to you? No, you don't need to. Just give me the information now. I can write it on some new files. I don't really need the photos if you've got photos there. OK. Well, Peter Austin first. Now, is that Austin with an I or Austin with an E? It's A-U-S-T-I-N and his address is 110 Argyle Street, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, tn 3 5RQ. 110? Uh-huh. And his phone number? It's 07984-645-792. OK. And how old is he? He's 47. 47. And what about his marital status? He's married. There's a note here that he has three children, two boys and a girl. OK. And finally, when did he join the company? He started with ESCO in August 2003. Thanks, Maggie. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what about Jane? Her name's Jane Moore, that's M-O-O-R-E, and her address is 72 Cedar Road, Crowborough, Kent, CR3 5RQ. CR3 and what, sorry? CR3 5RQ. And how do you spell Cedar? C-E-D-A-R. Her phone number is 07984-650-396. 07984-650-396. Yes. Now, she's 22 and she's single. OK. And she started with ESCO in 2005, February 2005. Right. Thanks, Maggie. That's very helpful. <laughs> Goodbye now. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a prospective student and a university advisor about applying to enter the university. First, look at questions 11 to 13.
As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. I'm interested in entering your business administration program, and I'd like some information on how to apply. I'm a little concerned because I've been out of school for a number of years. That could actually work to your advantage. It's possible to get academic credit for work experience if that experience is related to courses in our program. I've been working in business for several years. How would I get academic credit for that? First, you'll need to read the university catalogue to see if any of the course descriptions match your specific job experience. For example, if you've worked in accounting, you may be able to get credit for an accounting course. So, then what would I do? You would write a summary of your work experience, relating it to specific courses we offer. Submit that to the admissions office with a letter from your work supervisor confirming your experience. Now look at questions 14 to 20. As the interview continues, Would I submit those things at the same time that I apply for admission? Well, that would be the best idea. Have you seen a copy of our university catalogue? Not the most recent one. I have a copy from last year. You'll need to look at the latest one. Unfortunately, I've run out of copies, but you can get one from the library for now, and I'll send you your own copy as soon as I have more available. Thank you. How does the admissions process work? Well, first you'll need to get an application for admission. Those are available in the admissions office. The application form contains all the instructions you'll need. That sounds simple enough. Of course. You'll need to make sure you meet all the admissions requirements. How can I know what those are? We have copies of the requirements lists for all university programs here in the counseling center. I'll give you one before you leave today. Will I need to get recommendations from my employer or former teachers? Oh, yes, you will. The recommendation forms are available in the admissions office. Now, I don't know if you'll also be applying for a part-time job through the university work-study program. I'm considering that. How can I find out what kinds of jobs are offered? You can access the job listings from the computers in the library. Are you planning to study full-time or part-time? I want to be a full-time student. Good. Then you'll qualify for the work-study program. Part-time students aren't eligible. As a full-time student, would I be eligible for a free bus pass? No, unfortunately. We don't have those available for any of our students. However, you can apply for financial assistance to help pay for your books or for your tuition. I'd like to look into that. Do I apply for that at the admissions office? No, that's through us. You'll need to make an appointment with a counsellor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. Oh, I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's... A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world, and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking, and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes, and... Our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. 
Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault, it's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that, that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester, we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all, as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but... Some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave, uh, let me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about geotourism. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 34. Now, I'd like to move on to talk about something called geotourism. Geotourism is very basically leveraging the benefits of tourism for local communities. I would just like to give you a couple of statistics which are very illustrative of the current situation with regard to young travellers and international tourism. Firstly, tourism has an impact on more people worldwide than any other industry. Indeed, it has an impact on one in every two people, either directly or indirectly. The second statistic is that in global tourism, there is a 97% economic leakage. This means that if you spend £100 on going on holiday, normally only £3 of that money will actually reach the people who are giving you the services and the accommodation, for example, in the destination. If you put these two figures together, you can understand why some of the regions of the world which have very high levels of tourism still have very high levels of poverty and huge developmental challenges. These countries have this massive industry demanding a huge number of services, but they are not seeing a fair reward for these services. Geotourism is about changing this. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 35 to 40. Projects are now being developed with financial organisations such as the World Bank. 
One of these involves developing a technology platform which is bringing grassroots travel products such as hotels, locally owned hotels, not global chains, very locally owned tour operators to the international travel market, therefore avoiding the middlemen. These middlemen often cut them out of the market completely or just make their business unsustainable. Another way that geotourism can be promoted is through the niche travel market of volunteering. These days, a significant number of older teenagers want to spend a gap year, either between school and university or university and employment. Often, these people want to spend some or all of their year volunteering, but they either don't have the money or don't feel inclined to pay the main volunteering organisation businesses the fee they require, which can be as high as £3,500. What they are looking for is an organisation who can connect them with people on the ground, who can suggest worthwhile local projects. So, this is a real win-win scenario. The organisers charge a small flat fee, which then goes to the local contact. Thus, the local contact gets a very good commission just for one customer. The customer is also saving a large amount of money and time, both of which they can give to the projects they end up working on. There is still quite a long way to go before poverty in the most popular of tourist areas is eradicated, but a focus on this type of geotourism could provide an answer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I'll be discussing with you writing task 2 and the question for today is there are different methods businesses use to increase their sales. What are the different ways companies use to increase sales and which ones, which one is the most effective? So this is the double question. Like we have to answer this for very first question like what are the different ways which company use to increase their sales and which well, you know which one method is most effective so we will be starting with the introduction businesses nowadays apply a range of approaches to enhance sales revenue including online and offline advertising marketing trustworthiness and enticing deals means exciting or attractive deals and discounts to attract clients and credibility so these are the some factors or the you know different ways which companies are using to increase their sale revenue to enhance their sale revenues however in my opinion advertisement is the most effective technique to promote sales so i have given the answer of the first question here that what are the different ways and then the second answer is here that in my opinion Advertisement is the most effective technique to promote sales. Now body paragraph 1. There are a plethora of tactics or strategies used by companies to boost their sales, to increase their sales. First and foremost, advertising as it boosts sales by raising awareness, by raising awareness and informing potential buyers about a product or services. So if any any company has launched a product then definitely they will go for advertisement nobody will come to know about the product if the product is not advertised right? so the first thing is advertising offers and discounts can also help a company to increase its sales many businesses provide discounts such as buy one get one free to attract customers so offers and discounts can also help a company to increase its sales to increase its sales. Marketing is also a proven method for increasing sales. Customers are primarily attracted to 
unique and high quality items and services through marketing and as a result they become respected buyers so by marketing marketing strategy is also useful to increase or enhance the sales of a company apart from this con consumers can be rewarded as a part of marketing so the marketing strategy is like rewarding the consumer now this is our body paragraph 2 furthermore credibility is also one of the most critical criteria in gaining clients trust and making them feel at ease with products and services so if they can rely on the products you know like if i talk about apple so apple has the credibility right they have uh, you know won the trustworthiness of the people that's why they have a lot of clients for example strategies such as uh, customer feedback and internet marketing can help build customers trust in the item to increase reputation in selling so uh, what they can do they can just you know uh, show the credibility by sharing i have written it uh, in the next example by sharing the reviews of the people with their audience even though each part is critical the advertisement is a fantastic option because it integrates all of them for example a, if a company offers a special deal or discount it can be advertised advertising can also demonstrate credibility by sharing clients review with a broader audience so if they are you know sharing the viewpoints of their clients with the audience then it will increase the credibility which is also possible with the advertisement so because advertisement in integrates all these things like marketing can be done by advertisements right and credibility can be proven by the advertisements uh, apart from it you know uh, the products launch can be done you know the the companies can tell people about the product through advertisements so that's why i believe that advertisement is an effective way to increase the sales of a company to reiterate there are a variety of approaches for increasing a company's sale including marketing strategies credibility and offers but they are they all rely heavily on advertising right thus i feel that advertising is the most efficient method to expand sales so this is my viewpoint and uh, this was for today. If you like the video, do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'll meet you in the next video. Till then, bye, Bendik.